Welcome back. Now that we've covered the fundamentals of APIs and API marketplaces, let's now go into some real life applications about how one can pull these marketplaces out of their bag of tricks to tackle opportunities in this wonderfully challenging new normal. We'll start with the strategic model where we will go through the process of unpacking in great detail a business situation in which the use of API marketplaces can be of great value. We'll end off the section by laying the foundation for building an operational framework to implement the strategic model, tackling the actual framework in great detail in section 4. Let's get into it. Our starting point is a real-life business situation in case study format that we will now tackle in great detail. This case study involves a financial services company offering traditional financial products and services in a given market. This company has been in this industry for 23 years, incrementally modifying its products and services as the market evolves. The company has a good customer base, with churn in line with industry averages for the last four years across the traditional suite of products and services it has offered over that period. The challenge now is that in recent times, say 10 to 18 months, the company has been experiencing higher than industry average churn for some of its core products and services, with competition from entities previously far away from its core business market. Their usual bag of tricks in dealing with competition doesn't seem to fit this new market competition construct, meaning they have to think of entirely new ways in order to navigate this situation. Furthermore, when these new industry phenomena were initially developing in terms of the competitive landscape, the company thought there was not much in these trends in the medium term that they had to worry about. However, when the pandemic hit, the need for alternatives within the market accelerated some of these trends to the point where they are starting to have an adverse impact on them earlier than anticipated. In terms of products and services, their portfolio includes transactional banking that they added seven years ago, which they extended from a promotional cashback initiative they had on their insurance products. On this campaign, customers received cash back on a card that they could then use to make purchases with their cash back from designated partner retail providers. This initiative was so popular with the growing customer base that the customer then converted these accounts into full service financial transactional accounts where customers could put their own money apart from the money they earned from cash back. The initiative drove up customer loyalty for insurance products, along with creating a new revenue stream via transaction fees. As already mentioned, the company offers insurance products. This is the market the company was originally founded to address 23 years ago. The list of items covered has evolved over time having started with just funeral cover. Some items, such as vehicle insurance, were added for revenue-generating purposes, whereas others, such as household pet damage cover, were added as customer value drivers to benefit from intangibles such as brand loyalty. Appending the transactional accounts, the company offers savings accounts at attractive interest rates. These savings accounts were initially marketed as claim access accounts, where customers could benefit from lower insurance premiums if they had a healthy balance in their excess savings account. Over time, these savings accounts evolved to become traditional fixed and flexible savings accounts. The company has a small but very loyal transactional account customer base. This base has mainly consisted of customers in the middle to upper ends of the market, until recently when the company started to see significant uptick from the lower end of the market. 
This uptick was as a result of a partnership with an affordable food retailer, where tellers at this retailer were incentivized to push products from the financial services company. The transactional card afforded customers heavy discounts for certain products at this particular retailer. In return, the retailer earned commissions on contracts signed in its store and had access to a market where it could heavily do below-the-line advertising to push and convert sales of high-inventory non-moving items without having to invest in a loyalty program or some sort of data collection initiative that its low-margin business could not really afford. This growth is now significantly slowing down because a large telco has used the highly popular Airtime Advanced service to perform aggressive product education for its mobile wallet and mobile money services. The company has also initiated a loyalty incentive scheme where customers get points for purchasing data and airtime, which can then be converted to mobile money and used at various retailers via USSD or QR code. Furthermore, these telcos are slowly extending their device insurance offering to cover other items outside of ICT devices. And it's only a matter of time before they start to fully play in the field of short-term insurance in tangible terms over and above brand affiliations. The reduction in interest rates has driven customers to look for alternatives in growing their savings on the back of constrained income, high costs, limited disposable income and low returns on fixed savings accounts. The highly volatile stock market on the back of the pandemic has created quite a buzz on social media, further fueled by provocative stock predictions from popular tech executives and know-it-all celebrities. Smaller trading platforms have benefited from the exposure, with consumers typically intimidated by such pursuits getting interested enough to dip their toes. Some of these platforms offer decent interest rates for storing money on their platforms, while the customer ponders which positions to take. The result has been, at least for hopefully those with disposable income, shunning or emptying their fixed savings to double in trading. In any case, the appetite to offer savings accounts is very low, as some of these accounts have fixed periods well into the pandemic period at high pre-pandemic interest rates, which is not a good situation for the financial services provider. The bottom line is that fixed savings are a non-performing service line at the moment, and it's likely to remain that way for some time. On the top end of the market, there's been quite an interest in new financial constructs such as crypto and the like, presenting both opportunities and threats for traditional financial services providers. Furthermore, the pandemic has had such a devastating effect on those with deep pockets that others are gambling with whatever is left to seek get-rich-quick alternatives to replace lost income or reserves, engaging in above and below board crypto schemes and the like. On the bottom end, the main market drivers are affordability and access. This market is known for high operational overheads, low margins and high product education costs the more complex a product or service is. So access to sophisticated products such as investment instruments tend to be difficult because access is typically designed to only be convenient to those considered to be on the upper end of the market. The perceived psychographics on the bottom end, such as high spending funerals being considered to be more dignified than ones where frugal spending is evident also drive product design in terms of what is likely to be popular in this market, where volume can be achieved with decent margins and low overheads. Risk products such as funeral plans and life cover are the ones typically aggressively targeted at this end of the market. The devastation COVID has caused in communities in terms of loss of loved ones livelihoods and means to survive has accelerated the demand for these risk products, mainly in sectors of the market where a sudden unexpected expense or reduction in income can significantly affect a family's ability to survive.
In terms of the internal status of the company, they have relied on the same shape and delivery of their products and services suite for some time, with not much changes made to the portfolio for a number of years. They have a sizable customer base on the risk portfolio side, offering price-conscious options for products such as funeral plans, where these options are essentially the same cover with varying value adds such as free airtime and grocery vouchers. Top of the pyramid, consumers typically have multiple savings and investment accounts across multiple providers mainly attracted by projected returns on their investments, so the customer base for savings and investments has ebbed and flowed over time. A similar picture applies for the transactional market, mainly driven by the loyalty point scheme where upper market customers use the card for convenience and small purchases online, protecting their main transactional account for transactions at trusted providers. The market strategy is one that has been driven by trends in demand, which is not a bad thing. They have invested a lot in creating access points for their biggest and growing market base, where access and use of digital channels is still very low, and customers still prefer to talk to a person face to face. Previous successful promotional campaigns such as the Loyalty Points transactional account have carved out a two-tier customer base, which they have responded to operationally in quite an effective way, modeling their customer support and channels based on the core needs of each tier. As much as they haven't done much from a product innovation perspective since that lovely loyalty transaction account, they have invested in effective continuous improvement, driven by working around burning customer support issues, although the implementation of some of these interventions can be best described as the Bend 8 approach. The motto has mainly been, let's just do anything. If they stop complaining, then we move on to the next thing. The sustainability of the solution hasn't typically been a key concern. Their objective is quelling customer frustration at the lowest cost as possible to cap overheads. From a technology as an enablement perspective, they haven't done much in the way of exploration, let alone execution. Hence, they were caught off guard when their growth slowed down significantly only to realize that their customers were taking up extremely cheap risk cover from telcos. Telcos are especially motivated because customers who typically take up these products are prepaid, which has made customer profiling difficult because these customers don't have to provide much information about themselves other than Rika info, which is highly unreliable in a sense that people buy multiple SIM cards for friends, family, girlfriends, etc. When these customers sign up for risk products, they get more insight about them and can have real data to personalize offerings outside of what the customer is already paying for. The telcos are beating them at their own game, afford customers the opportunity to pay for their risk products using loyalty points they accumulate when making airtime in data purchases.
The company is also plagued by the silo effect operationally, which 